first I'll introduce myself. My name is Marguerite Rausch. I'm the Supervisory Librarian at Subbase New London. Captain Woolrich will speak to medical issues of concern to submariners in their daily life under the sea, medical issues of concern to submarine force leaders, the history of that research lab, and the role their research has played for supporting the health and well-being of our submariners for many years. Captain Woolrich, thank you. Uh, I'm assuming I'm talking mostly to a knowledgeable submarine office, uh, submarine uh, audience. Is that a fair statement? Anybody that doesn't know, in, doesn't know very much about submarines? Okay, a couple, that, that's good. I, I just got to be careful how many acronyms I use. In the Navy, we speak in acronyms, and that means nobody will understand us. And so I, if, if, please feel free, if I use an acronym, to ask me to explain it. Now, if it's a 30-letter, multisyllabic Latin word, of something in medicine, I have no clue. So bear with me on that. As you can see from my title, I'm US Navy retired, not US Navy Medical Corps. I'm not a doctor. I am a naval officer, a Mark I, Mod Zero, Navy Nuke. I know submarines pretty darn well. Uh, I love them. I've worked with submariners all my life. Uh, I continue to do so, and I really have had a, a great joy working with the folks at the Submarine Medical Research Lab. It's a very small but very unique uh, organization. Uh, if you'll see in the name at the Naval Submarine Medical Research Lab, it is Submarine Medical Research Laboratory. So it's the only submarine medical research lab in the United States. There are about, a, I think, roughly a dozen uh, medical laboratories in the Navy, roughly, I think, about the same number in the Army and the Air Force. So we're not talking large numbers of these organizations. We're the only one that's dedicated to the submarine force. And, and that's pretty unique. Now, as you'll see, as we go a little bit further into the talk, talk, there are only a couple of places that this type of research might apply. Submarine is obviously one. But the other that you might not be quite so, might not be quite so obvious to you is a spacecraft. So we work with NASA fairly regularly, particularly now that they're planning the mission to Mars, because the, the problems that we have addressed for now 100 years in the submarine force are exactly the same problems that NASA is seeing with Mars. If you haven't read the book, The Martian, there's a movie that I think just left the theaters. Actually, it's pretty good. But the book is terrific. And if you're a, a nerd like me, you like numbers and stuff like that, it's a great book to read. So I'd recommend you that, that looking at that. If you, if you have an interest in what I say today, and seeing how it applies here, I think you'll see some of that. <coughs> now, I should give you a disclaimer. I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm not necessarily going to tell you what the Navy thinks or what the Naval Submarine Medical Research Lab thinks. If I did, I'd have a very prepared and approved and everything brief. I'm just going to talk about what I know about Navy medicine. A lot of that's my own personal experience. But a lot of it is what I've picked up in listening to the very bright researchers I work with at the Submarine Medical Research Lab. So most of you, when you think about a submarine, this is what you think about. It's big, it's black, it's got lots of parts and pieces. Uh, it's got arrows pointing everywhere and signs and all of that sort of stuff. That's what you think of when you think about a submarine. And that's, not a, that's a good representation for guys like me, techies who do this stuff for a business. That makes a lot of sense. But for most people who just want to think about a submarine as something that carries people, this is what you ought to think about. It's a cylinder. It's a tube. You paint it black, and you put people inside. Well, how do you make them make that cylinder so that they can live, work, do the things they need to do? Well, first of all, you put Sammy Sailor in there. And he, he requires some very specific things. So there's Sammy inside the cylinder. And he, what's some of the things you might want to have to keep him alive in that sealed cylinder? Oxygen, that's one of them, OK. Water. Food, water, oxygen. If you've got the three of those, basically, that, if you put a decent amount of the right foods, you put water inside, you put oxygen inside, you can live for a long, long time in one of those cylinders, whatever that length of time is. OK? There's a couple other things you've got to do. You gotta get, if you put all that stuff in, you've got to take it out at some time. So it, at some point. You've got to get rid of primarily CO2, which the CO2 is what your body exhales when you metabolize the food that you eat to, to do the, the work and the energy, to expend the energy that you have. So you've got to get rid of that stuff. And we have systems, and I'm not going to get into them today unless we have time and, and interest, uh, to get rid of the CO2 on board the submarine. 
The next obvious thing is human waste. You have to get rid of that. Same thing, we have systems. Generally speaking, it varies with the types of ships you're on, but primarily we, we, we put the human waste into tanks, we pulverize it, and we pump it over the side. Pretty simple, not, not terribly hard. The other thing for those of you who are submariners who will know is we are fairly anal about keeping the submarine clean. There are two fundamental reasons for that. The first is, if you don't have good sanitary conditions, you're going to have disease run around, and that's a bad thing. Secondly, if you don't keep it clean enough to keep the equipment running, the equipment cl uh, clogs down, and then we don't have the atmosphere control, all the other things we do. So we have very complex atmospheric control systems. And again, I'd love to talk to you about them, but that's a lecture in and of itself, so I won't talk about that. So when you think about medicine on a submarine, I would tell you you really ought to think primarily industrial hygiene. Anybody know, does that term mean anything? Anybody who doesn't know what that means, let me put it that way. Because I, I think of it more as an industrial hygiene problem. Now, we will have medical problems on board a submarine. <clears throat> because you're going to put 130 of your closest friends on that submarine. You have about the living space of a three-bedroom uh, ranch house. I mean, you're close packed. You, don't, you can't bring a lot on board. And if you bring any diseases into the ship, you're going to be sharing those with your friends. The typical sea story is you get about three weeks of sharing everybody's cold, and then once you've done that, you're all immune and you can move on to whatever it may be. Uh, I don't know if that's ever been medically proven, but I, anecdotally, I, I can say that's probably correct. Uh, again, if somebody comes in with a virus or something like that. Now, what we do not have on a submarine is a physician. We do not carry doctors on board our submarine. We do carry what are called independent duty corpsmen, uh, IDCs, or medical department, rep they're the medical department representative, and they do represent the medical department. These are experienced corpsmen, guys that have been in, normally they're on their second tour, sometimes longer. Uh, if you're lucky, you get a senior chief or a master chief, those are really experienced guys. But they are what you might think of as a physician's assistant. You know, they're not going to operate on you. I know you've probably seen that on a TV show somewhere where the guy, they take a, uh, uh, a, uh, a guy's appendix at, out, and I, I know I have seen it. I've never seen it physically at sea, but I have seen them do minor operations. Uh, and when somebody gets injured, I know I, I you know, had a fairly bad gash across my head. They sh sh uh, sewed that up. I mean, they can do all of that emergency medicine. Plus, they are plugged in via the satellites to the force headquarters and the physicians at the force headquarters. So they have a problem that's outside their scope. They will call in to uh, the force headquarters and say, these are the symptoms we've got, this is our diagnosis, what can we do, what should we do? And then it's sort of a long-term collaboration, long-range collaboration, and we decide as a, as, a, as a ship whether to bring the ship back in to solve that medical problem. I'll give you an example. Uh, we were about to slide underneath the ice. We were doing a two-month ice deployment uh, when I was in command, and one of my guys came down with a kidney stone. Uh, we had a choice. We could either uh, pull over to Reykjavik, where there was a bad storm running, or we could go for three, three days underneath the ice to the ice camp. They could set up a rescue, and we could take him up to the ice camp. I did, I've done transfers at sea before. They are extraordinarily dangerous, particularly if you've got somebody who's really sick and particularly in a bad storm. So I chose not to go to Reykjavik. I went underneath the ice for three days. We kept him stable. My corpsman did that, did a great job. And then we got, they had an airplane waiting when we got there, flew him back, everything worked out fine. But those are the kind of things we do. So medicine is, is not low key, but it's not high tech on board a submarine. Occasionally you'll get a guy pulled off and sent to an aircraft carrier where they do have physicians aboard, and they do have operating rooms. We don't have that. We can rig our wardroom as an operating room. It's ugly, you don't want to do it if you don't have to. Okay, so this is a slide from the Medical Research Lab, and it gives you an idea of the kinds of things we do at the Medical Research Lab in the world of submarine medicine. You would think, well, we've been sailing submarines for, for 100 years now. We ought to know everything there is to know. And that's right to some degree. But submarines have changed dramatically from the first submarine. The first submarines, for example, had gasoline-powered engines. Well, gasoline is not a, 
you don't want to live inside your car with your engine in the car that in which you're living. That's what they were doing back then. Not a good scenario. In World War II, when the uh, Type 7 Charlie submarines, the first German submarines, came across uh, to attack our shipping on the on our east coast, uh, they would fill their bilges with diesel fuel, so they had enough fuel to get over and get back, and then operate. I mean, it, it, from an industrial hygiene point of view, it was horrible. The relative luxury that Dean Brown got to serve in on the submarine force in the Pacific in World War II uh, even had air conditioning. Uh, most of the German units did not have, have air conditioning, but they didn't serve in the Pacific either. So we have to look at a lot of factors that change for a couple of reasons. One, the equipment's changing. Two, our knowledge of the whatever uh, physical conditions are changing. And three, the people change. You, and I'll, I'll tell you why I'm saying that. Uh, so if you look at it, we tend to look at, on the left-hand side, performance, health. Then we look at the physical side and the mental side. So I'll start up in the upper right-hand corner with the mental side. We look at uh, the psychological factors. We do something called subscreen. Uh, we, we administer the exam to every submariner who comes into the submarine force to see if he's mentally fit to serve in a submarine. And you say, well, I know a couple of submariners, and they weren't terribly many mentally fit. So I can understand that, and I don't I disagree with that. Fr frankly, I would tell you, you've got to be nuts to serve in a submarine. But, you know, somebody's got to do it, and that's how we decide. So, uh, and we look for, a, there's a, I want to say, 260 question test that everybody takes. And it, it looks at a number of things, uh, the obvious things, claustrophobia. Uh, if you're a loner, if you can't get along well, you've got to get along with other people to serve on a submarine. It, and it is a close environment, and if you don't like your buddy, eh, it's going to get ugly quickly. So you've got to figure out how to do it. And, then, and we try to screen those out as, as, as readily as we can. What we are seeing today, and, and we're revising the test. The test has been revised over the years, but it looks like it, it probably could stand a major revision because the millennials, the ones who are coming into the submarine force today, are tremendously different than the young men who came into the submarine force when Dean Brown was a young sailor in World War II. Uh, different motivations, different aspirations, different understanding. I mean, if you walk outside, you'll see half of them sitting there with, a, with an iPhone. You know, uh, Dean and I didn't know what an iPhone was when we started out in the submarine force. And that's not a bad thing, but, you know, it, it is what it is. So you've got to get used to how people deal with each other, what kind of entertainment systems we have on board. A guy can today, for example, can take his iPhone, plug it into the, his bunk, have a TV up in front of him, and watch TV. So he could be, you know, he could stand, watch, come back, eat a meal, sit in his bunk, and never talk to anybody else. That's not a good situation because you've got to know how the rest of the team is doing to do this well. It's a complex job. Uh, we look at team performance. You have to ask yourself, how can you ever have an accident on a submarine which has all of this fandangle neat equipment and the brightest people we can, we can screen and, and train and put on, and they still run into things. They still run into other ships, they run into mountains, they run into other things. Now, none of them do it because they want something bad to happen. They all do it because something's not working in the way we either train them, the way they work together, how they communicate, how we display the information and all that. So we have a really interesting project that the submarine force is interested in a lot right now on team performance. So how does a team perform and interact with each other? It gives us, now about the right, that's not the right way to say it, it gives the submarine force a tool that they can use to evaluate how effective their, tool, their teams are. And we bring them from what we call a brittle team, which is one that has everybody well, well enough trained to do their job, but as a team they don't work well together, to a very resilient team who, can, who work as a team and everybody's backing everybody else up. So let me tell you, as a captain, I made mistakes. One of my problems, and, and Bill can back me up on this, is they think, you're the captain. If you say it, it must be right. Well, maybe not. So you want somebody who is smart enough to say, Captain, I don't think you want to do that. Now, I love those kind of guys. I love them. And i got to tell you, my backside was saved any number of times from people like that. Uh, one particular incident that I would have done something very stupid if my leading quartermaster chief hadn't come up to me and said, Captain, don't do that. You know, and he was right. But he had to have the guts to go up and talk to you. That's team performance. 
Resiliency is something we've been working on. I think it's there on the waterfront right now. I'm not sure how, how, uh, how well it's working at this point because I haven't played in it. But we're trying to get to the sailor on the waterfront. Our most vulnerable population is the new submariner, the guy that just graduated from submarine school. He's on his first tour of duty. We give him a stack of books about this thick to qualify with. Uh, we assign him as a mess cook. Everybody, no, you probably don't know what a mess cook is, but he's in there scrubbing the decks, feeding the chow, all that sort of stuff as he, as he starts out. And in his spare time, we work him 12 hours a day, and in his spare time, he's supposed to grab his books and go back and qualify and figure out where the pipes and the valves and this and that are, because we require that of every submariner. And in a year to a year and a half, he has to be fully qualified. If he isn't, we throw him off. A lot of pressure on that young man. If he's not well acclimated to the other sailors on board the ship, if he doesn't have a good buddy he can walk up to and say, gee, I'm really lost. Can you help me here or something like that? Now you got a guy that's in trouble. We don't have many suicides, but we have enough. And we want zero. That's the only acceptable number. So that kind of thing is where we go with uh, resiliency training. We try to teach them the, how to be their own best buddy. We try to teach their shipmates how to watch out for them. It's not simply a suicide thing. It's, we want them to succeed. It doesn't do us any good if we spend a year training the guy to get on board a submarine. He comes on board and fails in his first six months. That's not a good thing. We'd like to get every guy through and be successful. Uh, okay, we'll go maybe human factors. These are other things that, are cons that we look at. Uh, for example, uh, oral processing, how, how you orally hear things. I'll show you a chamber we have later on. I think, yeah, I'm good on time so far. But, but where we can tell you where the sound's coming from very, very easily, how you process sound. You, we all hear my voice differently. Your ears are different than mine. Your processing systems are different from mine. So how do we use the most effective processing system? And one of the simple things we did uh, not too long ago was we, we got the submarine force to buy noise-canceling headphones for, the, for their sonarmen. Uh, sonarmen are listening. They're, most of their displays are, are visual displays, but they're also listening to everything out, out in, the, in the ocean. And so it helps if they know how to process that information. And if we know electronically how to process that information, from what sensors are we taking it? Are we taking it from the sensors in the bow of the ship? Uh, modern submarines have sensors all along the hull. We string tow to rays back behind the submarines. They all sound differently because they work in different frequency ranges. So how do you process all of that information? So that's the kind of stuff we're looking at for the oral processing, visual data processing, I spent my whole career using a periscope. A periscope has a 32 degree window you look at and you're constantly walking around. They call it dancing with the periscope. You know, you're dancing with Matilda on the, on the con as you go around trying to see what, what the visual contacts are up there. Now we're coming up with the 360 degree periscope. We finally have A, the audio, I mean, I'm sorry, the visual equipment that we need to do it. And we have the, more importantly, the processing equipment. It takes a huge amount of computer processing to be able to look at essentially everything above the water at one time. Great, now we can do that. How do you display it? Do you put it on a 18 by 18 TV screen? Do you have a 52 inch screen monitor? Do you put it 360 degrees around you? Do you stack one over the other? So we're looking at a number of different displays and trying before they actually build the equipment. And this, I would tell you, is a new concept for the submarine. Nah, it's not a fair statement. But, but you know, we're now looking at how we do it before we build it. Because in the past, we tend to throw money at things, build this neat piece of equipment, and it doesn't mesh well with the, next, with the piece of equipment right next door with it. Now we want to build the displays as we think they should be, get the submarine force to buy that, and then you tell the contractor to do something, and you tell him to do it with enough money. He'll do anything you want to do. It works if you do that kind of thing. Um, undersea war fighting. This is, I want to say, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, we have one of the experts sitting in the back, one of my uh, colleagues from, from the lab. And I, I would defer if we have questions to him. But there are a couple, most of this, most of it, this portion of it has to do more with divers. We carry divers on board a ship. There are five divers assigned to a submarine. 
takes a bunch of training to get on to get it through to get them through. We don't typically dive from a submarine unless we have a casualty in a remote port or if we have a casualty out at sea. Uh, diving out at sea in the open ocean is a dangerous business, so we try our best not to do it. It has happened occasionally, but we do carry five divers aboard. And that's how, by the way, to get one guy working, that's how many people it takes. You know, it's not that you can put a tank on a guy and drop him over the side. You have to have, a, he has to go down with a buddy, you have to have a rescue swimmer up topside, you have to have uh, a diving supervisor and one backup. So that's, that's how we do our, our diving. But one of the things that I'm most proud of that we do have done at the uh, medical research lab is submarine uh, survival and escape. If you talk to most submariners, they'll say, hey, sub ship sinks, I'm dead. Well, that's not true. Most of the accidents that occur, occur within sight of a port, not, not sight, but within a reasonable distance of a port, and in waters from which the submarine can be salvaged. Look at the Kursk which was a, neighbor, uh, a, a Soviet missile submarine that sank probably about 10 years ago. Uh, she had a massive explosion in her, her torpedo room, blew the front off the ship, uh, killed most people, but when the ship went down, they had, a, I think it was around 19 sailors in the engine room that survived. Now, they were unable to get a rescue team to that group of people, and so they died in the end. But we, we go to great pains to make sure that if you get into an accident and you're on the bottom, you can do two things. One, if you must, you can escape. Now, we also have rescue systems, but it, we allow about seven days. We, the submarine force, allows about seven days for the rescue systems to get on top of that submarine. Will it take fully seven days? I don't know. You mobilize every asset the United States has to get it there. Is it fairly close in? Is it off Norfolk or something like that? No, I don't think it'll take seven days for that. But if you're in the Western Pacific somewhere, you're on the bottom, it may take seven days to get there because you have to bring the equipment to a port, you have to get a ship there that you can weld all the stuff on its deck, and you have to get all the people assembled, you have to sail, find the sunken submarine, get the, uh, uh, stabilize the situation so that you can get the rescue equipment down aboard and start rescuing the people. Seven days is a pretty reasonable time. And we target our rescue efforts for that. So there are seven days worth of certainly water, food, much more than you ever need. Oxygen is probably the, the uh, most difficult problem we've got, and it's different for each class of submarine. Uh, for example, uh, on a 688 class, which is the right now the, the largest number of submarines we have out at sea, they have oxygen banks on board. The Virginia class submarine, which has what they call a low pressure electrolyzer has, it doesn't have high pressure oxygen banks. So it has to carry more oxygen candles, which are a chemical way of making oxygen. Remember what I told you about ex getting the CO2 off the boat? If there's anything that's going to cause you a problem for seven days, assuming the bulk of the crew survives the actual incident that gets you on the bottom, it's going to be CO2 because it builds up pretty quickly. So one of the things this lab here did, these folks that I work with, is came up with a, a CO2 curtain and there are two versions of that now. One's a, a uh, powder version of it that has to be refilled and hung. But they also have come up with one that's a solid curtain, which I think is a beauty uh, to work. And, and we, cover, we hang those things all over the submarine. So you basically, pretty hard pressed to breathe enough CO2 out without getting it captured by these curtains so that you won't kill yourself. When you, your CO2 reaches about 5 or 6%, you're almost incapacitated. At about 10%, you are incapacitated. So you've got to keep that below about 2%, and we do a pretty good job with that. So you got your oxygen, you got your CO2 removed, you got some water on board. You don't have to drink a lot, but you've got to drink some, and there's plenty of water on board. That's not normally an issue. So you can wait seven days until that rescue system gets there. One of the problems that if you go back into the World War II archives that we had is some of the guys on submarines that, got, that were sunk chose not to escape. Now the escape systems uh, that uh, Mr. Brown had to work with back in World War II with the Momsen Lung, which was a tough system to work with, you had to be trained in. They were not, and some of them chose to stay on board the submarine and die. 
When I was trained, I learned with the stinky hood, which is basically a life jacket and a relief valve and a hood that goes over you. And the relief valve releases oxygen from the life jacket as you're, as you're going shallower and shallower. And you breathe that oxygen, you get to the surface. It really works. It works well. I did two escapes with that. So I'm very confident that I could get to the surface on that. What I am not confident in, and Bill and I were not confident in, was whether we could survive on the surface. Because once you're up there, if the water's 38 degrees, you're going to last maybe two hours, and you're going to die of hypothermia. So the other thing that this lab did was it came up with the Mark 10 Sci suits, submarine escape immersion suit. Uh, actually, it's British. We didn't invent it, but we were smart enough to say, hey, they got a good idea. Let's steal it. And, and they were happy because they get a lot of money for suit and all that sort of stuff. And actually, we work now to improve the suit. But it is a full suit. It will keep you warm. You float like the Michelin man in the, in the water. And when you get up on there, it has a, it, to your leg is attached a life raft. You inflate the life, ra life raft. It has a cover on it. You get in. It's got a, you know, some systems for making water so you can survive while you're floating around. We even came up with a little streamer on the back of it that makes it visible from the air. Because one of the problems, you can't get guys out quickly. You get about two at a time from the escape trunks. So they pop up to the surface. They do all their stuff. And while, they're, while the next team is getting ready to go, they've drifted two or 300 yards off in the wind or the tide. Next guys pop up. And pretty soon, you've got a line of, guy, line of guys five miles long that may or may not be visible from an aircraft. And you're not going to be found by a ship. You're going to be found by an aircraft. So this makes you much more visible by the aircraft. It's incremental stuff that's done by really bright researchers that say, hey, how do we solve this problem? And those kinds of problems exist when you're trying to do an escape. Submarine wellness, physiology. Uh, again, I'm going to defer to my colleagues when, if we talk on that, but there are lots of things we look at um, for uh, what the CO2 levels on the boat are. We'll talk as I get a little bit further into this. But this, the carbon dioxide levels on board a submarine are about 10 to 15 times higher than the carbon dioxide levels you're breathing here. And that has an effect over the long term on, on a number of issues. Uh, epidemiology, this is sort of in its infancy. We have probably, I would argue, the best healthy worker database in the world. We take submariners who are you know, pretty, very physically fit. When we feed them well. We give them great medical care. And they ought to have no problems. Well, of course, that never happens, does it? But the fact is that if we've got that database, we can take a close look at if we've got the best situation in the world, what should it look like? And now you can take and compare the rest of any number of populations in a factory, anywhere else. And if they're exposed to another environment, you can compare it to the healthy worker database. So we're trying to get the long-term look at what the submarine force health profile looks like over the years. For example, if we expose you to 10 or 15 times the carbon dioxide levels for the time you're on a submarine, is that a long-term physical issue? We don't see any, but you have to do really careful studies to look at that. Uh, oh, hearing conservation. It's, one of the biggest problems the Navy has is hearing conservation. You say, well, it's a submarine. Isn't it quiet? Yeah, not inside. You know, running along in the engine room at flank speed doesn't get any noisier than that. It really is quite noisy in some areas. When you fire a torpedo tube or a missile tube, it, it can be very, very noisy. And if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, don't have hearing protection. Or equally as important, you don't understand the importance of hearing protection, you're going to get some serious hearing loss. Now, I have hearing loss. It was primarily due to the submarine force, but back in the, in the, to my military service, more broadly, you fire uh, firearms all the time. We never, we didn't need no stinking hearing protection. You know, we're too tough for that stuff. But, uh, you know, it's something you really do need. And I, I, I will tell you I ignored it because I didn't know any better. Nowadays, we know better. And we're trying to convince everybody to do it for themselves. And it, it's hard because Tell you a quick C story. So I'm, I'm teaching some sonarmen on uh, one of the issues we're doing. And, and we were chatting about uh, you know, how they protect their hearing. And, and one of the guys said, well, you want to see my stereo system? I said, sure. So I went out. To, he's got a truck. Uh, not a truck. Uh, van. Yeah, van. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Big, big thing. Uh, young guys like those things. I'm not into that, but that's OK. Uh, 
he has got this thing loaded with stereo equipment in the back. And I didn't know, but there are groups around here. They go, they have meets every month or so, and they demonstrate to each other their stereo systems. Well, we got in that, and I would tell you, it was a gorgeous stereo system. But I turned it up maybe 20% of the max volume, and I couldn't stand it, and my hearing stinks. So I'm thinking, nah, here's a guy whose life, livelihood depends on his ability to hear things, and he's exposing himself to that kind of noise. I mean, you've all heard it. The, you're, you're sitting in your living room watching television, and a kid drives down the street next to you, and you can hear his stereo. You know, that, that's, that's a bad thing if that's what you do. So anyway, we try to convince sailors that hearing conservation is really worth their time and effort. A couple of other things that uh, we call a shipboard health and performance, the circadian rhythm. If you're serving submariner, most of you, eh, like Bill and I, retired. Um, all right, but now they are on an eight-hour watch cycle. Now, you talk to the ONC of the Nautilus Museum. Uh, he served on, on ships, I think, Reg, is that right? Yeah, that have done the eight-hour cycle? I've not done the eight-hour cycle. Oh, you haven't. Well, I'm sure you've heard enough gripes about it. For many people, that's too long a cycle. It's a long time to sit in front of a sonar screen, eight hours at a time. By the way, the normal maritime watch historically has been four hours. Four hours on, eight hours off. And that, by the way, fit very well into the circadian rhythm. I'm, you probably have all heard the term circadian rhythm. It's your body's natural rhythm. You know when you fly over to Europe and you're five or six hours out of sync with your current time zone, you're tired for a day or two afterwards until your body gets back into sync with that same rhythm. Our natural rhythm's 24 points, something or other, plus or minus two, two hours. Now, everybody has a slightly different rhythm, but by and large, we expect that. And when we there are natural clues that, well, I'm going to, this is a cool word if I can remember it, super charismatic nucleus, super charismatic nucleus. It's in the back of your eye, and it, it's sensitive to the 700 uh, nanohertz um, <coughs> um, uh, blue light, and, and it tells you, hey, it's time to wake up, if you see that. Conversely, if you don't see that, it tells you it's time to go to sleep. And then some of the hormones, uh, you know, like, Melatonin is a, is a good hormone that will, it will cause your body to secrete to go to sleep. So those things are natural things. You're, you're used to doing it. We simulate it to some degree on a submarine. If you haven't served on a submarine, we keep the engine room fully lit all the time. The forward part of the ship, in certain areas, we may go to a gray light, like the control room, to sort of simulate day and night. The bunking areas, our lights are out all the time, except when we're fielding, cleaning up the, up, up the areas. And the rest of the ship has lights on all the time. So it's hard to simulate a day-night routine unless you, you know, move yourself to that. So we are, and we were causing our sailors to go into an 18-hour cycle. Nobody has an 18-hour circadian rhythm. So they're always tired. And when we went back to look at the causes for some of the accidents we were seeing, we said, gee, these guys were awfully tired. And we were able to measure that to some degree, and we said, well, maybe we ought to look at the circadian rhythm. It took about 12 years of research, and I would tell you Herculean and heroic effort on the part of the medical guys to try to convince the guys like me, the line guys, who have always done it on 18-hour cycles, that you really ought to think about a 24-hour cycle. And God bless the guys that run the submarine for us, because they were smart enough to listen, and, and they're, they are changing the way we do business. The submarine force is not all enamored with this. Some of the guys like it, some of them don't. It's up to the discretion of the, the commanding officer on the ship how he cycles his people. But what we try to make sure they understand is when you go off the circadian rhythm, you are dooming your guys to being more tired than they need to be. If you're already working them 12 to 14 to 16 hours, maybe you want to think about giving them that kind of rest. And it's hard to do. Those of you who have been to sea on a submarine, they can get very busy depending on where you are. And it doesn't take much of a mistake to get a really catastrophic outcome. So rest is very important. Circadian rhythm is important. Uh, and last but not least, I'll talk about, and we'll talk about some other things here, but the atmosphere on board the submarine. We're very careful about monitoring the submarine's atmosphere. But one of the things that was not done until about, eh, I'd say, 15 years ago now uh, was take a close, deep look at one of the trace contaminants on board the submarine. So there are, 
at various times there have been measured something like 300 chemicals in the air on submarines. Oh my god, that's horrible. Well, most of them are very, very low levels, and, and most of them don't have exposure limits set on them. Those that do and that we know about, we, we monitor as closely as we can. So we have a program called SAHAP, Submarine Atmosphere Health Assessment Program, where we go on certain ships, not all ships, not all the time, and look at that, and then look at it across the board in the way you would with industrial hygiene to make sure that you're not, something's not creeping into the industrial process, the way we build submarines, the way we paint submarines, the kinds of mattresses we bring aboard that changes the air we breathe and over the long haul, 20 or 30 years, could cause a problem for a sailor. That's what that program is designed to do. That program was designed at the Submarine Medical Research Lab. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the air you breathe. This is what you, this is the air you breathe in the perfect world. So most of it is nitrogen. I'm sure most of you know that. Uh, and if you measure it in uh, technical terms, it's 593 torr. The oxygen is what you breathe. That's what you need in your body. If we could stop there, we'd have the perfect atmosphere. But we don't. There's a lot of trace contaminants in the air on, that you breathe. The most noticeable one in most air is argon, which is an inert gas. And there's a small amount of carbon dioxide in the air. That is what we call one atmosphere. That's the pressure, the air pressure that you feel right now. And that comes, you know, that's 14.7, if I remember correctly, pounds per square inch. That's the weight of all that air above you sitting on top of you, OK? Uh, that's the 100% of the volume. And we would see that as 760 torr. This is what a submariner breathes. Has a, a, and I've, I've got, this is what the submarine tour measurement is, but uh, that's, that's what this is. And I only put the ones that are, uh, what I think are uh, appropriate. And this is just a copy of the, what I have on the previous slide. But you can see our, the oxygen level, it goes from about 130 to about 160, and that's about if I remember the numbers correctly, about 18% to about 22% oxygen. And that's what we keep it at. We, have, we call it oxygen bleed. Uh, we take the, remember I said we had high pressure oxygen banks. We bleed that in as we need it. If the level goes too low, then we cut it back if the levels are too high. Now the trick I used to use, and I can let that out to this crowd because nobody's going to tell anybody else, is whenever we had a field day, I'd turn the oxygen bleed up all the way <laughs> so that we had high oxygen level and a lot of energy in the guys when they were cleaning the decks. Now, don't tell anybody I did that. Um, carbon dioxide is, we keep it less than 0.5%. Uh, uh, that is, that's hard to maintain. Our equipment is, is pushing hard to maintain that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's important that we do that for a number of reasons, and I think I'll cover some of those a little later on. Uh, hydrogen, I mentioned, uh, not that there's a lot of it in there. In fact, we try to keep it very low, but it's produced by the submarine's battery. We have large battery, 126 cells. It can power the submarine probably at very low rates of speed, but enough to keep, keep things going for about three hours if it had to. Um, it uh, produces hydrogen when it sits there and just on its normal trickle charge, but when you're charging the battery, you can, you can get a lot of hydrogen. So we have we monitor to make sure that hydrogen is A, dispersed, not collecting anywhere. Because if you get over, and I think the number is about 7%, and you get a spark, you got lots of oxygen there, you make water. And it's a big boom. And you don't want to do that. So we're very careful about monitoring for hydrogen. And we also have another piece of equipment, Bill's Atmosphere Control Equipment, which is a CO, carbon monoxide, H2 burner. And it, it takes those chemicals and creates less harmful chemicals and, and in a, I won't get into the chemistry on that. But it works quite well. We're, we're able to maintain levels. I would mention, by the way, I, yeah, I didn't mention on, on the other slide. I think I mentioned it later on, but I, I want to make sure I mention uh, carbon monoxide. There are a number of sources of it, but the primary source in the past was cigarette smoking. Now, when Dean was on submarines, when I was on submarines, there are a lot of guys that smoke. I was one of the few guys who never smoked. I don't know. But I hated it. I've always hated it. Right now, we, are, we do not allow smoking on board submarines. I think that's great. 
If you're a smoker, it's not so good. So uh, it, it is an issue. Uh, we stopped, I think, in the year 2000, so it's been a while since we've allowed or not allowed submarine, uh, smoking on submarines. And from a health point of view, it's, it's a great boon. Again, it's not much fun if you are a smoker. But as guys like me got stuck with secondhand smoke, and that was the main argument for getting it off. We finally were able to demonstrate unequivocally when we're looking at physiology of submariners that the guys who were non-smokers never put a cigarette to their lips in their life were, were getting the same effects as the smokers, and that was unacceptable. And so it took us a while, but we got there. I had one of my, my fine young officers burn a hole in the captain's chair in my wardroom because he dropped his cigar. And I cut out smoking in the wardroom when that happened. There was no more smoking. <coughs> All right, we, uh, refrigerants, very small quantities. You don't see much of that if we keep our piping systems tight. But they can displace oxygen, and, and if, you, if you have a leak in a, in a, a refrigerant system, and we have several refrigerant systems aboard. One is the system that keeps our foodstuffs cold. You have a freezer and a chill box. And the other is the air conditioning system that we have on board the submarine to keep the temperature reasonable. If you did not have an air conditioning system on the submarine, and, and Dean would say, well, you guys are such wimps. We had to, we had to live in the Pacific Ocean without uh, air conditioning systems. They actually did have some decent air conditioning systems back then in the fleet boats. But uh, today, with the steam propulsion systems we have in the engine room, the temperature would go up to about 150 degrees uh, after, aft in the engine room, and probably to about 110, 120 forward. And it's a moist 110, 120. So it's very hard to live in that environment without air conditioning. The second thing that most people don't think about, sure, it's a creature comfort thing, but I'm sure that the taxpayer could care less about creature comforts given the cost of all those systems. But if you don't have that, you can't run modern electronic systems. And we thrive on modern electronic systems. You know, we, our electronic signal measures, our sonar systems, uh, all of our computer systems for running a very complex weapon system, you got to have those things running. So air conditioning is a big deal. And then the other thing is the trace contaminants, and this is what the SAHAP program uh, measures. It measures down in the millitor and microtor level. Those are really, really no millions or uh, hundreds of millions uh, uh, of tors. Very small level uh, to the extent that you might be looking at you know, one mile or a tenth of a mile if you, were, uh, if you could lay a string of these things across the United States. You have to, it's very tough chemistry in, uh, to do, but we have the technology to do it. And I think we're coming in the next 20 years to the point where we can actually real, real time measure that with some of the systems that are coming down the line. It's going to be very interesting. All right, which button here? All right, so a little history of the Submarine Medical Research Lab. This is the kind of submarine that Dean uh, would sail in World War II. Uh, uh, we did a lot of stuff on the submarine selection back there, psychological screening, uh, selection and training of sonar. And how do you, prior to World War II, there really was not much in the way of how do you detect something underneath? They, they didn't think about it. Nowadays, we have very complicated systems that give us a very good picture of the things that are out there in the world. And the night vision, we did some, we developed the test, the basic test that most people take now to see whether they have adequate night vision and whether they can distinguish colors. <clears throat> In the 1950s, Nautilus was launched, 1955, and um, we looked at the effects of the prolonged exposure and the initial things on submarine escape. And that's about the time that the Stinky Hood came into being. Uh, we did a lot of the studies on saturation diving in the, in the uh, 1960s. Uh, I think I have some better pictures of this, but this is our genesis chamber. Uh, we can put several men, I'm not sure what the max number, probably five or six, uh, up to 30 odd days. We can feed them, we can house them, you know, there's toilets in there. It's not pretty, but they'll survive and they'll, we can do the experiments, human experiments that we need to do. By the way, I should mention, uh, it's not as easy as finding six divers who will raise their hand and go inside a, 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 a tube for, for 30 days. Uh, when one of our researchers decides he needs to look at something for protocol, let's say high CO2 exposure, he has to write up a detailed paper. 
and that gets submitted to a long review by the scientific review board and a human subjects uh, safety board, basically, that look at both aspects. Is it safe for the people that we're going to experiment on? Is it going to, is the experiment going to do the things that the researchers think it is? And it's a very tedious, I, I will tell you, process. Then we get volunteers. You just can't order a sailor to risk his life. And I pretty reasonable. If that was your son or daughter in there, you'd want that to be the way we do it. And so we get volunteers. Sometimes we reimburse them, sometimes we don't. Depends on the, on the situation. But, uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. It's, it, I would tell you, there were times, uh, eh, 30s, 40s, 50s, I don't know, when things might have been a little looser than that. Um, the, the, I can't remember, there were, uh, Wendy, you might remember the radiation study, uh, you know where they put the, the nasal radiation study. Yeah, that was done. That was done very poorly. And when when people got a hold of that, they went nuts, and they should have gone nuts. And so we're very careful about the kind of experiments we do. But there are things that need to be looked at, and some of them are dangerous. What's an example of that? Underwater effect of sound, high high sound. You know how do how do we keep somebody away, a swimmer? Who's trying to make an underwater attack on board our one of our submarines, on the piers, uh, and the sub base? How do we prevent that attack? How do we detect it? How do we make him go away? There are ways using sound that we can do that. But we have to know exactly what those levels of sound are that will cause problems. Uh, as the underwater blast. Uh, we had some divers, some of our divers went down to help when the uh, Challenger was lost. And, and uh, also in the recovery of the, uh, the monitor. Remember the monitor, the, uh, I mean the Civil War uh, ironclad, it was sunk off the coast of Virginia. Well, when that was recovered, the blasts that occur to, to clear the sand away, to move the stuff, it can do some real damage to divers. And so we did a lot of the research with those guys along with that. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, let's see. Alternate watch schedules, I've talked a little bit about that. That's been in the 80s and, and into the 90s. Cold weather physiology. We, we take the uh, rafts that the, uh, I'm going to terminate here in about two minutes. So I want to kind of whip through here. And I'm not going to get through all my slides. I'll be happy to come back and talk if anybody wants to uh, after the um, uh, ribbon cutting. but. Um, we pay a lot of attention. Oh, we, we would take the rafts from the side suit and we took it up to the Army's Natick lab up in New York and we put our, our divers in there and uh, you know, in ice water with 30 knot, 30 knot and uh, uh, 30 degree wind blowing over them to see how long they could take it. And they all quit right around the 24 hour point, but those are under the worst conditions. I'm comfortable that if, if my survival depended on it, my son's survival depended on it. That, that raft and that uh, sight suit would last for, for multiple days till we can get some rescue people there. Biggest problem we're going to have if we lose, if a submarine sinks, is making sure somebody knows it's sunk. That's a big problem. We can talk about that at some other time. But that's not a medical research problem. These are the sampling badges we used for the SAHAP program. Uh, we determined this is a submarine wrapped up so that it won't lose any heat or gain any heat from the outside. We wanted to see how we expected when we wrapped, you know, we, we shut the submarine down, we kept the crew on board, and we wrapped it up like this. We expected that it would get really cold on board there. What we found is because of the anechoic coating that we have on board the submarines now and because of the latent heat inside of the submarine and the CO2 removal system that we have on board, it has got really hot in the submarine. We never expected that. So that, that was a really interesting thing. We have done the research on getting women into submarines. Are they, is the submarine the right environment to put it in you know, get away from whether it's right or not? That's a political issue more than anything else. Women can do the job if they choose to do it. What we're trying to make sure is that if they do it, it's safe for them. And we, we did the determination and it was there. The submarine force made the decision to put women in submarines. They're in there now. Next step, let's see what's happening. Let's, you know, let's watch what happens to make sure we're not doing any damage. And let's see, we've already talked about the rest of this stuff. We, 
That's what it looks like inside a Virginia class command and control system. Uh, these are the sonar systems on the back. These are the combat systems. These are the two guys driving the ship. They're actually called a pilot and co-pilot. They have little joysticks and computer screens up front that they have to work with. They, they don't drive the ship per se as they drive, they punch numbers in the computer and the ship drives where they tell it to. So it's a lot different from what those of us who have sailed submarines over our lives know. But it's really neat. Uh, navigation systems, the officer of the deck or the commanding officer would stand here wa watching us. This is where we want to, how do we display that 360 degree periscope, for example. I'm going to terminate here. Thank you so much for coming. I hope I didn't bore you. I, a lot of technical stuff, but I love talking about it.